Since man first set sail on the open seas, tales of monsters, strange creatures, phantoms and ghost ships have all found their way into the hearts of every sailor and landlubber alike. But it's the stories of ghost ships that were met with the most fear and trepidation. With sailors being some of the most superstitious people on earth, no wonder that anything out of the ordinary could in their eyes be an omen of misfortune. In these so-called enlightened times, many of the stories are dismissed as wishful thinking, lies or mistaken vision. However, by dismissing these apparitions, are we not doing a disservice to all of those who have witnessed such events, sane, lucid people from every walk of life, with nothing to gain from their accounts? With so many sightings across the world's oceans, there must be something that lurks in the mist. And this episode is about one of the most famous of all ghost ships, the Mary Celeste. On the 4th of December 1872, a brigantine was discovered adrift with partial sail in the Atlantic Ocean just off the Azores Islands. With no crew, no sign of a struggle and no reason as to their disappearance, this discovery became the most famous maritime mystery of all and the curse of the ghost ship Mary Celeste was born. Built on Spencer's Island in Nova Scotia, Canada, her original name was Amazon. Many believe that she was cursed from the off, but whatever the truth is, she was a ship that had a very troubled history, which started on her maiden voyage. The Amazon's first outing was on June 1861. She was set to sail to five islands to take a cargo of timber before crossing the Atlantic to London. Her master, Captain Robert McClellan, soon fell ill after loading was complete and his condition worsened at sea. Some of his crew noted that every time he gave an order, he would cough incessantly, with some reporting seeing his handkerchief full of blood. With his health deteriorating rapidly, the ship returned to Spencer's Island, where sadly, Captain McClellan died on the 19th of June. A new captain was soon employed, John Nutting Parker of Walton, Nova Scotia. However, the bad luck continued. The Amazon collided with fishing equipment on the narrows of Eastport, Maine, but then continued on her journey to London. After discharging her original cargo and then being reloaded again, she set off for Lisbon. Soon after departing, she ran into and sank a brig in the Strait of Dover, the narrowest part of the English Channel. Luckily, all hands were saved. The next few years went by without issue, and in 1863, a new captain had taken charge of the Amazon, William Thompson. In autumn 1867, the Amazon had sailed from Baltimore to Cow Bay, Halifax, with a cargo of corn. Shortly after unloading her cargo, she was caught in high winds and the storm drove her ashore where she was abandoned by her owners as a wreck. Alexander McBean of Glace Bay, Nova Scotia petitioned to take ownership of the vessel on the 14th of October 1867 and he was granted such a day later. He quickly sold her on to John Howard Beatty, no relation. A year later, the Amazon was bought via a New York auction by mariner Richard W. Haynes for $1,750, or around £1,300. In today's money, that would be about £25,000, give or take. By December 1868, and after spending almost $9,000, £6,700, she had been fully restored. Haynes made himself captain and although many mariners believe that changing a ship's name is bad luck, she was officially registered as a US vessel on the 31st of December, 1868, under her new name, Mary Celeste. Within a year of her name change, Payne's fortune had sadly taken a downturn and the vessel was seized by his creditors, being sold on the 13th of October, 1869, to a New York consortium consisting of one-time ship's captain, James H. Winchester, who had six-eighths of the shares, Daniel T. Sampson and Silver Goodwin, who retained one share each. 
In 1872, the Mary Celeste underwent a comprehensive $10,000 refit, about £7,500. The ship was made considerably larger, and a second deck was added. When complete, she was also given a new captain, Benjamin Spooner Briggs. It was always considered in those days that a captain with shares in a ship would be a better captain, and so the original shares were further diluted to give the captain some sort of ownership of responsibility for the vessel. The original eight shares were made into 24, and the ownership now read James H. Winchester, 12 shares, Daniel T. Sampson and Sylvester Goodwin, two shares each, and Captain Benjamin Briggs, eight shares. But who was Captain Briggs? Captain Benjamin Briggs was born on the 24th of April, 1835 in Wareham, Massachusetts, the third of six children. On the 9th of September, 1862, he married his childhood sweetheart, Sarah Cobb, daughter of Reverend Leander Cobb, who presided over their wedding. A competent seaman by this time, Briggs had already commanded the brigantine Seafoam and the three-masted schooner Forest King. Benjamin and Sarah's union brought forth two children, Arthur Stanley, born on the 20th of September, 1865, and Sophia Matilda on the 31st of October, 1870. A curious side note to the Briggs family is that Benjamin's brother Oliver had his own fair share of disasters at sea. He lost the Thomas Jefferson, owned by James T. Winchester, who had shares in the Mary Celeste, in a storm off Cape Hattera. He lost another ship, the Royal Charles, in ice returning from a voyage to Rotterdam. And sadly, his final voyage was in a vessel that he had personally heavily invested in, the brigantine Julia A. Halleck as he drowned after the ship foundered in heavy storms in the Bay of Biscay on the 8th of January 1873, with the loss of all but one of his crew. Now this occurred just over a month after the Mary Celeste was found. After being loaded with her cargo of 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol on the 5th of November 1872, the Mary Celeste left Pier 50 and set off from New York Harbour but because of bad weather, she was forced to anchor just off Staten Island. However, two days later, the weather had changed and she set sail for the Atlantic and into the annals of maritime history. On board were Captain Benjamin Briggs, his wife Sarah, daughter Sophia and seven crewmen. Albert G. Robinson as first mate, Andrew Gilling from Denmark as second mate, Edward William Head as steward and cook, brothers Volkert and Boz Lorenzen, Adrian Martins and Gottlieb Guchard making up the rest of the men. A month later, Wednesday the 4th of December 1872, sea date 5th of December, the ship De Gracia was midway between the Azores and the coast of Portugal when the helmsman reported to her captain, David Morehouse, that he had seen a vessel about six miles away sailing erratically and unsteadily towards them. With the signals from De Gracia being unanswered, Captain Morehouse suspected something was wrong, and after realising it was the Mary Celeste, he boarded the ship. His initial observations were that the sails were partially set, but in poor condition. Some sails missing and the rigging damaged, as though the ship had been adrift for some time. A frayed rope was discovered attached to the stern of the ship. The main hatch cover was secure, but the fore and lazarette hatches were open and a single lifeboat was missing as was the whole crew. The interior was wet from water entering through the open hatches and untidy. Personal items were scattered about Captain Briggs's cabin and his unsheathed sword was discovered under his bed. The ship's papers seemed to be missing, however the ship's galley was in good order with all of the equipment stowed neatly and with ample food supplies for around six months and there was no sign of violence. Three feet of water was found in the hull, as well as a broken hand pump in pieces, as though it was being fixed. What we can't say for sure is how much water was in the hull when the ship was deserted, and the amount found could have very well have entered the ship after the crew had vanished. The water pump could have been broken, or just being tested through a very regular maintenance routine that all seagoing vessels had at the time. The final entry on the ship's log was dated 8am on the 25th of November, nine days earlier so the untidiness could have been put down to the ship being thrown around on the waves as it drifted for a number of days. 
The log stated that the Mary Celeste was in sight of the Azores Islands of Santa Maria, 500 miles from where she was discovered. So, what happened to the crew? The only thing we know as a fact is that they were never seen again. What could have caused a very capable seasoned captain and a hand-picked crew to vanish from the face of the earth? Well, the theories are many, and as I like to keep an open mind on all possibilities, they're all worth a look at. However, after many years of studies, I am convinced that one is the definitive answer. Here are the most popular reasons. Some believe that because nine barrels of denatured alcohol were empty, the crew took to sampling the cargo, became violent and unruly, eventually murdering the captain and his family, even possibly turning on each other. When the surviving crew sobered up, they threw the dead bodies overboard and left the ship in a rowing boat for a nearby island. The problem with this theory is that there was no blood found on board, no signs of any struggle, let alone a fight to the death, and the fact that the alcohol was industrial grade. It would have been poisonous, and therefore would have killed all those who drank it. So this doesn't hold much water, if you'll excuse the pun. However, there is a report on the 25th of November, the date of the last log entry of the captain, the first mate's wife had a dream or vision that her husband had been murdered by the crew. By all accounts, she woke up screaming and believes there was a mutiny. It is said that in his sea chest a letter was found, that he had began writing to her on that very same day, and had abruptly stopped writing. Well, this again is up for great speculation. If he stopped writing a letter because he was attacked, he wouldn't have had time to secure it back in the sea chest. And the fact that the log entry admitted any unease with the crew, this idea is highly unlikely. Pirates have always been a threat to cargo ships at sea, but if it had been pirates, they would have stripped the ship of all of its belongings, or even seized the ship itself. They certainly would have taken all of the food on board and any equipment they could use. But the ship was in good order, with no signs of being boarded or ransacked, so this too carries little weight. There is only one reason a captain would voluntarily abandon his ship, and that is if it is going to sink or no longer seaworthy. Some believe that a combination of faulty chronometer, rough seas, a broken pump, and with land in sight was enough for the captain to give this order. This theory has a great deal of what-ifs attached. As the chronometer was missing, there is no evidence that it was faulty. The last log gave no indication of bad weather or being lost. So for this to work, it all has to be assumed. There was a broken pump found, but the water in the hold wasn't enough to destabilise the ship. And the fact that the ship sailed on its own for some time afterward goes against the idea that it was damaged and in immediate danger of sinking. We have to ask why would such an experienced captain and his sailors abandon a perfectly sound ship? This is all very possible, but not very probable. There has been an idea that the ship was lost because of faulty equipment and all abandoned ship. Again, with the exception of a broken water pump, no proof of faulty equipment could be found and the idea of leaving the safety of a large vessel with a fully intact sail rig to enter a small rowing boat and be at the mercy of the sea is far-reaching at best. Would a perfectly competent captain do such a thing? In my opinion, highly unlikely. Was the ship cursed? It's true that the Mary Celeste had a history of unfortunate incidences, death, collisions, bad weather, bankruptcy, running aground, but so did many other ships of the era, especially around this time. There were more ships on the ocean than there had ever been previously, so more accidents are going to happen. If the ship wasn't cursed, maybe the Briggs family were. Now this is something not many people have looked at, but have a listen to this. His brothers Nathan and Zenas died at sea from yellow fever. His brother Oliver drowned after his ship foundered in bad weather. His sister Maria drowned when a ship she was travelling in was rammed by a steamer and his father was struck by lightning while he stood in the doorway of his own house. Is this all a coincidence or a curse? I'm going to leave that one to you. There are also stories of ghostly phantoms aboard the ship 
and it's that which scared the crew enough for them to abandon the vessel. Unfortunately, there are no records or reports of paranormal activity on the Mary Celeste prior to this voyage. However, that alone doesn't fully discount the possibility as hauntings always have to start for the first time. Could this have been the first time? The alien abduction theory is growing in popularity. There are many people who say that they have been abducted and many have witnessed others vanish into thin air, never to be seen again. If we are to believe that such things are possible, then yes, it certainly could be a reason that they vanished. This theory will always be down to whether you believe in aliens or not. Since the first ship sailed, there have always been talk of sea monsters, large beasts that appear from the depths of the sea and attacking ships. As we don't know what is beneath us in the depths of the world's oceans, we can't say that large monsters don't dwell in the depths. The idea of a giant squid was poo-pooed by many until one was found. The Megamouth shark was discovered only in 1974. Before that, it had never been seen. So what else is out there? However, the thought of the Mary Celeste being attacked by a large sea monster does create more questions than answers. She was in such good condition with no signs of attack, so therefore it is unlikely she fell victim to a Kraken-type sea monster. The Mary Celeste's cargo of denatured alcohol was a volatile one, and the nine empty barrels may lead more to this being the actual reason they abandoned ship. When industrial strength alcohol is mixed with water, it gives off a yellowish gas. Most of the barrels were made of white oak, which is perfectly stable for this type of cargo. But the nine empty ones were made of red oak, which is more porous. It would only take a large water spout or large wave to breach the hull and seep into the red oak barrels to create the smoke. Or some of the cargo may have even seeped through the barrels into the water. Seeing this, there would have been a panic that the Mary Celeste was on fire, and so a very quick evacuation would have been made. Everyone jumping into the rowing boat, tying a tow rope to the stern and effectively being pulled by the ship, with the crew waiting to see if the smoke dies down before boarding again. With the rope being frayed upon the ship's discovery, it may have snapped, leaving the whole crew to the fate of the sea. A spark of a sailor's pipe could have caused a flash explosion that, although leaving little trace behind, would have had the same effect of panic. One of the many reasons for the mystery surrounding the Mary Celeste was down to Sherlock Holmes creator Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who, in January 1884, published his own account of what happened to the Mary Celeste in the Cornhill magazine, entitled J. Habakkuk Jeffson's Statement. Although this account was fictional and fanciful, many took it as the truth. Some added to it, some changed it, some embellished it, but it's this short story that gave birth to many of the myths surrounding the Mary Celeste. Thanks, Sir Arthur. The problems with the discovery of the Mary Celeste continued for the finders. Maritime law states that if a vessel is found adrift with no one on board, it can be salvaged by the finders. Basically, they take ownership of it. After some speculation as to the legitimacy of the salvage claim, Captain Morehouse came under great scrutiny. Eventually, he was given the salvage rights, but only received a small percentage of the vessel and cargo's value pointing to the suspicious nature of the find. Some believe that the DeGracia crew boarded the Mary Celeste and killed all those on board. However, it is extremely unlikely and bears little weight to the reason that the Mary Celeste was adrift and empty in the first place. With theories abound, the most plausible is that of cargo coming into contact with seawater and the crew abandoning ship with the hope of returning. But a tragic accident saw them drift away, alone, and into history. The story and debate of the ghost ship Mary Celeste will continue for years to come. New theories will be offered, but as with Jack the Ripper, if it wasn't solved then, when everything was fresh and the evidence available, it will never be solved now. As one writer once said, as you can't subpoena the dead, you'll never know for sure. Although we cannot say for certain what happened to the captain and his family and the crew of the Mary Celeste, what we do know is that after being found adrift, the Mary Celeste was bought and recommissioned into service, but she constantly lost her owner's money, and they forcibly ran her aground on the 3rd of January 1885. With no one wanting to claim her, she became a wreck, 
slowly being smashed by the very sea she sailed, until she vanished from sight. So, where is the Mary Celeste now? In 2001, author and adventurer Clive Cussler claimed to have found her wreck. The vessel they found was of a similar length and width of the doomed ship, and so an announcement that the world's most famous ghost ship had actually been found. However, the celebrations were short-lived and rather premature, as a later analysis of the timbers retrieved from the ship he discovered showed the wood was still growing at least a decade after the Mary Celeste had sank. So the mystery of the Mary Celeste goes on and continues to be one of the most talked about maritime stories of all time. Thanks so much for watching and I really do appreciate you giving me your time. More episodes of Ghost Ships will be uploaded soon. See you then. Goodbye.